So many of you know that I spent the week traveling. I got to go to Chicago and uh, on to Philadelphia, where my sister teaches at a Catholic school. And I uh, visited my sister there, got to celebrate a school mass, and then I sat in on some of her classes. One of the classes she teaches is uh, freshman philosophy, actually, at a Catholic high school. And having studied philosophy in undergrad and college, I was a little jealous of these students that they got a head start and were able to study it already in high school. They were reading Plato's Apology, and in it, Socrates is making the case that that he is wise and that he knows that he knows nothing, and he's wiser than others because they do not know that they know nothing. And he at least knows that much. In scripture, we see a refrain that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And I think that this Socratic principle that that true wisdom begins by acknowledging our lack of knowledge, our nothingness before wisdom I think that that principle really goes well with what we hear in Scripture. Because to acknowledge our lack before wisdom is to acknowledge our nothingness before God. And that's, in some ways, at least, the fear of the Lord. That is reverence before God, to acknowledge our nothingness and how much we need him. I just contrast that experience sitting in that freshman philosophy class with uh, an experience I had actually in the Holy Land. I was coming to the end of a silent retreat and we had just walked down. We were at the Sea of Galilee and I'd walked along the shore to a park and was sitting um, near the site of ancient Capernaum in Galilee and a man walked by and saw the shirt I was wearing. It said, Plato's Cave Alumni. It was, my, it was my philosophy class shirt from college. And he saw it, and he started yelling something out at me. And I was like, what are you saying? He was yelling in Hebrew, and he eventually uh, spoke in English. Jesus loves you. I said, amen. He said, Jesus loves you. I'm like, yes, he does. Amen. You too. So you're a disciple. So I, I think so. I sure hope so. He said, well, something to the effect of a disciple would not wear that shirt. In his understanding of scripture, and particularly, I think, the the letters of St. Paul, who emphasizes very much the folly of the cross, that that to Greeks, the cross is foolishness. And uh, in in a strain of what St. Paul says, he emphasizes that the wisdom of God is foolishness to the wisdom of the world. And taking that and running with it, this gentleman was under the impression that that meant that to pursue wisdom was a fruitless effort, and all that we really need to do is to have faith. As Catholics, that's not how we look at faith. That's not how we look at wisdom, or philosophy for that matter. Jesus, in our gospel, emphasizes the need for wisdom. A wisdom that begins with the fear of the Lord. A wisdom that acknowledges our lack before God. So, this quest for wisdom, which is really a quest for the face of God, a thirsting for God, as we hear in our psalm. This, it's not an impossible or fruitless, futile effort, like that gentleman might have thought. Uh, Instead, I think that if we avoid this deep need that we have for true wisdom in God, 
what we're left with is being victims of the slavery of ignorance, truly not knowing even that we are ignorant. And along with that, we're left with our dependence on the expectations of the world and of ourselves. We cannot see what God wants from us. We're left with the intolerance that comes from a life of ignorance an inability to meet others truly an inability to dialogue with others without wisdom we're left with war Without wisdom, we simply keep repeating our past mistakes. I think we can see that we live in a world that desperately needs wisdom, and not simply the wisdom of Plato or Socrates, but the wisdom of God in Jesus Christ, the wisdom of the cross. And what does that wisdom bring us? Instead of the slavery of ignorance, True wisdom brings us freedom, freedom of heart, freedom from anxiety that we hear about in our first reading. To be awake, to be wise, is to be truly free. Awake. So this awake, wakefulness thing, it, it really bothered me in the gospel because Jesus ends the gospel by saying, therefore stay awake for you know neither the day nor the hour. And yet he calls the five virgins that brought oil wise. And yet all 10 virgins fell asleep. They all became drowsy and fell asleep. And to complicate matters more for me, St. Paul talks about those who sleep in Christ in our second reading, that those who are awake and those who are asleep will be brought up in Christ. So what does Jesus mean when he says, stay awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour? Well, if the wise virgins were the ones who stayed awake, But if they all fell asleep, what did they do that the others did not? Well, they brought oil. So their their alertness, their true wisdom, was that they, they desired so much to see the bridegroom that they brought the oil that would keep their lamps lit through the night. And even though all fell asleep, maybe that could be a symbol for death, all die. Some died with oil. Some stayed spiritually awake. Some carried with them into their night, into that sleep. They carried with them their love for Jesus. So let's go back to that second reading. What is St. Paul says that God through Jesus will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So to be asleep in Christ is to have fallen asleep, thirsting for him, yearning for him. Those who die in Christ know the peace of his protection. So then even in the darkness of death, we can carry with us our intense thirst, our thirst for wisdom, the thirst of our soul for Jesus, the bridegroom, who is wisdom made flesh. We can bring with us our hunger for the banquet of wisdom, the wedding feast that Jesus prepares for us. And we're reassured today that death 
isn't the end if we carry with us our love of Jesus. All at the end of our lives, we can pray that we hear, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him. So who is truly wise? If we look at our uh, scripture, I think the best example of a truly wise person, a truly wise virgin, is Mary. Mary is known as the seat of wisdom, and it's one of her titles, the seat of wisdom. Why? Because wisdom, that's God's word, became flesh in her womb. She is truly the wise virgin because she was ready to meet our Lord. She awaited God's word in freedom and in peace. And so a lot of those descriptions that we hear in our first reading of Lady Wisdom, I think they're reflected in Mary, even though they're talking about wisdom itself. I think Mary really reflects that face of Lady Wisdom, the beauty of, of the wise virgin who waits for God. And what does she receive? Well, she receives the true wisdom of God, Jesus himself, who becoming man to suffer for us, begins that journey in her womb, begins his suffering in her womb, And then that mystery of the passion, that foolishness in the eyes of the world of Jesus dying on the cross, that is for us and for Mary the true wisdom that we celebrate today. From the cross, Jesus pours out his spirit, the spirit of wisdom. He pours that out into our hearts. It's the same spirit that overshadowed Mary and the same spirit through which Mary conceived of wisdom. That same spirit is poured out into our hearts today as we renew and relive the sacrament, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, that outpouring of the Spirit. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet Christ your Lord today and always. Prepare yourself for his coming with the wisdom he offers you at this altar. Resplendent and unfading is wisdom, and she is readily perceived by those who love her and found by those who seek her. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to greet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them, but the wise brought flax of oil with their lamps. Both our first reading and our gospel speak of the virtue of wisdom. Wisdom is the first and the greatest gifts of the Holy Spirit in the sacrament of confirmation because it perfects faith by bringing it to fruition in concrete acts of love and service. One can be smart in a lot of things, but lack true wisdom in what really matters. This is one of the last three parables in Matthew's Gospel, told only a few days before his passion and death. 
Jesus' entire ministry is coming to a climax, and his teaching focuses on matters of eternal life and death. The parable is stark in its conclusion. The doors are locked after the bridegroom comes. Amen, I say to you, I do not know you to those five foolish ones. Therefore, stay awake. The ten virgins represent us. The image of oil was of great importance at the time of Jesus. People used olive oil for cooking, for their lamps, for medicinal purposes, and therefore oil was a valuable commodity. Virginity was a deeply respected virtue and represented purity and the singleness of heart as Jesus teaches in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Like those ten, we also grow weary at times, become slothful, and even fall asleep in our discipleship of following Jesus. Knowing this human tendency about ourselves, it is all the more reason for us to be prepared, to have enough oil of daily prayer, the sacraments, reading sacred scripture, Sunday Mass, Ministries of good works that shine like lamps, burning brightly for others. The five wise virgins knew that the decision to be a disciple is a deeply personal one that no other person can make for them. They took responsibility for their own lives, decisions, and actions of faith. The foolish did not. Watchfulness, not cleverness or last-minute planning, is what denotes a wise disciple. The watchfulness we seek is that which recognizes every opportunity to grow in virtue and holiness by manifesting our faith in good deeds, hope, as St. Paul mentioned in his second reading, and love, and then to act on these opportunities without hesitation. An example of such watchfulness can be found in the life of St. Mother Teresa, who, when presented with an unforeseen change in her schedule, such as an airline delay or canceled meeting, waiting at a bus stop, and so forth, would say to her sisters, Well, God has given us this gift of time. Let's use it to do good. And then she would begin to lead others in prayer, or reach out to others in need, or share a message of good news with a stranger. The foolish virgins were not good stewards of their time or treasure. They were not properly prepared. They did not take their responsibility. They did not take their responsibility seriously. They did the minimum to get by. They were stingy with what they had and thought more about themselves than about being ready for the bridegroom. What about us? This parable calls us to examine not only our intentions, but also our actions. Our annual stewardship renewal is not simply about getting volunteers to do the work and serving others in the parish, or enough money to pay for salaries and benefits, utilities, insurance, or coffee and donuts. Rather, stewardship is about an interior renewal of heart, mind, soul, and action. It is about conversion and concrete acts. It is about recognizing that all is gift from God. 
And we are asked by God to share generously on behalf of his kingdom. Will we take this opportunity and challenge that Jesus offers us to be wise, to be prepared, to deepen our commitment to following him and being faithful and wise stewards? Will we follow Jesus' example by laying down our lives on behalf of others and not merely focus on ourselves? I cannot answer that question for you. Only you can. I have had to struggle with those questions in my own prayer and my willingness to share from the abundance that God has given to me. The bridegroom is here. Let us go out to welcome him.